Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. This is your brother Nafis Abu Zayd. And we have an esteemed, we only want to call a guest, but he's coming back home. Alhamdulillah. We have an esteemed brother, uh, also a mentor, also someone we benefit from, Muhammad ibn Munir, the one that the brothers have called Mufti. Uh, Alhamdulillah, who also is very active. He has a YouTube channel, which is Hadith Disciple. He's also currently Imam that's located in Brooklyn, in Queens. By the permission of Allah Jalla wa Ala, the Mashi Ahl Sunnah, uh, wa Quran Ahl Sunnah. And here with me is my co host. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Isa Abu Isa. And welcome to our episode of the Night Shift with our brother Mufti Barakallah Fihi. So, Isa, you can start off the first question for Okay. <clears throat> the first question that we have for you, brother, mashallah, is that you're from Philadelphia. Um, this fitness that's going on in Philadelphia, which is kind of heated up in the last few weeks and the last month or so, me and the brother uh, Abu Zayd have been doing. Uh, being from Philadelphia and seeing all the chaos that's happening here, what is your thoughts about what has been done in the name of Salafia by a particular group of people here in the city? We know who they are. Okay. First and foremost is, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Thank you, Abu Zaid, Abu Isa, uh, Abu Zayn, Abu Sajid, all of the brothers here uh, who invited me. And by Allah's permission, made it easy, whether it was a, a ride or an idea or friendly push in the back to, you know, come and sit and talk with our brothers. That's first and foremost. And I'm happy to be on a night shift. Alhamdulillah. Inshallah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> uh, secondly is, uh, we can't forget to give salutations and greetings to all Hadith disciples. Yeah. Hadith disciples in Philly and outside of Philly. Uh, what I had, we just met a new brother. I think his name was Habib. I never saw him there in my life. He said, you know, I'm Habib. I benefit from Hadith Disciple. And I never saw him a day in my life. What led him there many others. Okay, so the brothers and the sisters who benefit from Hadith Disciple and who give any type of feedback, whether it's positive or negative, we're grateful. All right, and we make dua for them. What led him mm-hmm. As far as the question, then obviously it's a very long, extensive topic. I would say... One of the ways of us realizing what's right and what's wrong, one of the ways of us, by Allah's permission, implementing what's right and avoiding what's wrong, calling others to it, and then having the patience and the forbearance uh, to bear down on the rigors, all right, of implementing the truth and, act yeah. and, and calling to the truth, because it's not easy, it's a difficult thing. And it's one of the first things you learn, one of the first books you learn as a student of knowledge is named Muslim is a Surah al Fatiha. And we know the author, he says, that it's obligatory upon all Muslims to learn four things. And he says, first and foremost, al mm-hmm. All right. And then there's what? al amal bihi Actions. Al-Dawatu ilayhi. Al-Rabi'a al-Sawru al adafi He says, last but not least, is to be patient upon the harms that no. must ensue. Calling people to do something that's against their desires and their whims. No. All right. So I would say is we have to start thinking critically. We got to really start using our minds. And we know that the mind is one of the greatest gifts of Allah to man. And it's the way that Allah has so distinguished the human being from the animal. He gave the man the aql. And we all know that the ulama of Islam, they say that the word aql, that's the, the word for intellect, for brain, is related to the word iqal. And in Saudi they say igal. And igal is the black wrap that you see up top of the checkered scarf or the ghutra. And igal is basically a means of Pulling or whipping or steering a camel. So they say that the aqal yaqudul insan is supposed to drive and steer man. Mm-hmm. That which is right, that which is wrong. The animal has to be steered. You have to have a muzzle or reins. You have to put a carrot in front of a donkey or an ass for it to walk straight. But the human being is supposed to have enough aqal to walk straight. To be able to distinguish and differentiate between right and wrong, beneficial and harmful, between sweet and sour, between whatever he needs to distinguish and differentiate between. So I think that's one of the most important steps is for us to start using our brains, uh, for us to start using our minds, yeah. all right? And there's so many ways of you looking at it, all right? With regards to the specific question and the fitna and this one and that one, I, I'll say this right now, is that if you're a tough guy, if you're so tough, you have so much knowledge, you're on the hawk, everyone is a deviant, everyone's going to the fire, everyone's out of bidah, then why are you so afraid and scared and touchy when someone says something about you? Right. Does the criticism only work when you're on the offense? Every great champion has to have good defense. 
you have to have a, a, a great defense because everyone is not going to be scared of you. No. Somebody's going to find a chink in your armor and find out no. that your defense isn't impregnable. Mm -hmm. So you cry and you complain when you get hit. All right, you punch like a, like a, uh -huh, a steam hammer, but you got a chin of a poet. No. This is a reality, a chin of a poet. No. So why are you talking about the brothers? Why you say this about Fulan? You should approach them like a man. You are oh, stuck for the law. That's not right. It's fitting. Or don't talk about it. What happened to refuting people and criticism? Isn't that the, the lifeblood of this deen? The Quran is a book of refutations. That's what they say. Okay, so now we're going to talk about you and refute you. Everybody obviously knows what happened a couple years back. When I, that was just a little small, simple video that I did on a brother, mm. whatever the case may be. And the whole dunya stood up crying and complaining. Oh, why you say that? You shouldn't mm. have made the video. Take it down. Make it private. Oh, no. Kevin, what is this? Your blood is sacred. Mine isn't. Your blood is, it, your honor is sacred. Mine isn't. So one of, the, one of the ways for people to understand critically that something's seriously wrong is that when you bully someone, when you're on the offense, when you're attacking, it's okay. But the moment a rock is pelted at you, it's what? Peace, brotherhood, husn of dhan, and all the different verses in the hadith come. But when it's my honor, your honor, this match, this one is what? Drive the train. That's something seriously wrong. And if you can't see that as a layman Muslim, then something is wrong with your aqal if you even have any. That's a clear sign that something is wrong. Something's what? Something's wrong. We're not willing to have discussion. We're not willing to actually have somebody say something about you. And let's discuss it. Let's bring the proofs. Let's talk about it. Not, oh, the brother's honor. Honor? What's honor? How many people's honor have you slandered over the years? Mm -hmm. So let's stop the fake piety. Let's stop the games. Let's stop mm -hmm. the boohooing and the crying. Okay? You can't be a tough guy and be soft. It doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. If you're soft, then alhamdulillah, everyone doesn't have to be tough. Mm -hmm. If you're a scholar, alhamdulillah, everyone doesn't have to be a scholar. If you're a student knowledge, everyone doesn't have to be a student knowledge. But don't play the role of a scholar or a student, and then when someone refutes you and criticizes you, then you play the role of a jahid. All right, or the concept of everyone is a mujtahid. You talk to a brother, you get into a conversation with a brother, he'll give you advice. Oh, you said this, and Kevin, and Kevin. He can't even say out of bad tap property, but he's a mujtahid. And the moment you bring a proof or evidence, the moment you drop something on him that he doesn't have a ready-made answer for, oh, I, I got to go and ask. I follow the brothers, the scholars. How you go from a mujtahid to a mujtahid in one conversation? <laughs> no, it's one of them. And that's the reality that we're dealing with. So this yeah. is just one thing of showing you that something seriously what? Wrong. Seriously wrong. Wallahu alam. That's that's just a bit. No. Can I get some more tea, please? Inshallah. <laughs> no. The, <clears throat> no. The next the the, uh, the next question is is that um uh the issue of people of a particular brother Hassan Sumali. Okay. Um, him being here in our town, which obviously has caused a lot of division between the people of this town. With a lot of us have turned in, a lot of people we have grew up with, prayed next to for years. Me and you personally, Abu Sajid, he's saying people don't give us the salam today. Mm -hmm. I remember going to Sheikh Maraz's funeral, uh, Anwar Wright and the rest of them who know us from we were younger, no hair on our faces. Give them the salam, they turned their backs on us. So the reality is this Hassan Somali, what is your thoughts of the things he had done in our city to bring about a lot of this chaos in the name of Salafi? I would say yes. Uh, back to what I just mentioned about critical thinking. It's nothing wrong with somebody going to a town or a city and benefiting people. No. It's nothing wrong with migrating to a different city. I moved to New York City. No. It's nothing wrong with helping people out, teaching classes. That's fine. But I would say this. Whether it's pertaining to Han Somali or anybody else, no. even myself. If I leave Philadelphia and go to New York City and totally make hijra. I'm there, I'm a New Yorker, mm -hmm. and I live there. But that's not even a good example. It's only a two and a half hour drive, if that. But I go to another continent, and I never ever return back to my home. And I cause major fitna, division, separation, mutual hatred, mutual, mutual enmity. Then your brain, your mind, some type of question has to pop up. Whoa, first of all, if this is what you're saying it is, why aren't you not in your own country pumping and propagating this stuff? No. Everybody understand this? There's nothing wrong with you coming and benefiting the people. That's fine. We're not against that. That's nothing wrong with that. You can go to a different location and teach. But to cause a fitna and to destroy and to rip and to shred and not go back to your own country, something seriously what? Seriously wrong. Now, I, I'll tell you this. And this is not uh, an attack or shot at nobody, but it's stock. One day I was in Medina and we met a brother from the UK. 
uh, and you know, you, you know, where you from, so on and so forth. And he said, yeah, I'm from Cardiff. He said, I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm from Cardiff. He said, okay. I said, alhamdulillah, how's it, you know, what's, what's up in Cardiff? Yeah. He said, nothing. He said, Cardiff is dead. There's nothing there. It's empty. It's void. So the question is, is that if somebody leaves their home and goes to another location and makes a major operation and movement, mm -hmm. why don't you do that with? In your own home. That's the first question, critical. The second question is to cause fitna. And how do you become such a follower? Mm -hmm. Such a tag along. You see what I'm saying to you? In other words, if somebody said, well, if, if, it's, if it's so deep, then why don't you go home and do that then? And teach that and spread that there. I mean, how many other British people are in America? How many masters in the UK? How many graduates in the UK? How many scholars will visit the UK? And yet and still, they're all where? There. It's flooded. So something is seriously what? Yeah. It, something is wrong. And if I went to New York City and I taught classes, I did khutbahs, I helped some people out, and say, alhamdulillah, Mufti came to New York. But now when I come to New York City, I start talking about people. I start forcing people. I start making people to follow me, to blindly follow me, to take me. Mm -hmm. I cause division. I cause chaos and havoc and mischief. The first person, you, the first thing you can say was Saeed is what? Go back where? Home. Home. If you're so knowledgeable, Mufti, you have so much that you want to talk about and discuss and force people to do. Why don't you do that in Philly? Something's what? Something's seriously wrong. So the critical thought is this. As far as, oh, hey, alhamdulillah, the brother came to New York and caused fitting and division. The hawk. Huh? We're supposed to separate and split and become the mock. Obviously, we're not thinking what? Critical. We're not thinking critically. In the moment we stop thinking critically, mm -hmm. huh? we are not utilizing the gift of the what? That Allah is the best man with. Allah says, indeed, we have given the children of Adam nobility. We've given them nobility. Yeah. And from the greatest things of nobility, Allah's best man with is what? Is the mind. Yeah. Okay, now when we say the mind in Aqab, it's not to be misunderstood as some immature people think, oh, you're with Ahl Kalam or the Mu'tazila. No. Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they say, La yuqaddam al Aqab ala Naqab. They say the mind doesn't come before the text. And they never ever said that you don't what? Use the mind. You don't use the mind in front of the what? In front of the text. Or as Shaykh Hussain mm -hmm. Taymi used to say, al ijtihadu fil nas la ma al nas. He would say that you work hard, use your brain, exert yourself to understand the text, not along with the text. So one of the most important characteristics of any Muslim, let alone student knowledge, let alone imam, let alone da'i, let alone scholar, is aql. There's no doubt about that. Everybody throwing this? No. Yeah, 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 and if you're not thinking critically, then something's seriously wrong. And the moment we stop thinking critically, we live in a situation in which we're in. No. Whether it's Philadelphia or anyone else. Exactly. That's, that's, my, that's what I'll say about that. Wallah. Well, brother yeah. Munir, what was the turning point for you and the brothers, like Abu Hassan Malik, and um, a lot of the brothers from Espa? What was the turning point uh, for you? Like, I know right. they used to deal with you, they used to. Clear. You know, I would say this that. As far as brother Abu Hassan, I used to look up to him, alhamdulillah, and I've benefited from him, and other brothers as well, okay? Uh, I remember I was in high school, I had a book called uh, Studies, or Modern Studies in Hadith Literature, mm. Sheikh Al-Adhani, Dr. Al-Adhani, rahimahullah. It was an English book, I had it in my house, it was my father's book. This was one of the first books that really inspired me and caught my attention, it was al Hadith. Mm -hmm. So in the books they talked about the Isnad, Bukhari, this one, that one. It had a different uh, Asanid, Shajatul Isnad, all the stuff in the book. So it was a brother, brother named Jamil, in Jamia Masjid. I took the book and I showed him, I said, have you ever heard of this book, have you ever seen this book? He said, no. Nah. He said, you know you need to ask about this book? He said, go down what? This was the old Dawah Center. Who was that at? Um, oh, Margaret. Uh, Margaret, Margaret, Margaret Orthodox. Orthodox. Yeah, Margaret Orthodox. He says, go down there. Nah, it's a, a brother time. named Abu Hassan. I was in high school. He said, go ahead down and ask him about his book. He can tell you about hadith. So I went down there. Uh, you know, I, I told him who I was. This is the book. Mm -hmm. He looked at the book. He said, it's a good book. Excellent book. Read it and benefit from it. He said, read it and benefit from the book. Mm -hmm. All right. This was before I knew Arabic and stuff. So ever since then, I always had a good relationship with him. Mm -hmm. I used to look up to him. He, I would, you know, sit back and he would talk about Yemen, Sheikh mm -hmm. Mukbil. Asking questions, okay, no doubt I was young. All right, so uh, that's with regards to in how things used to be, even how Somali as well, okay? Everybody, all right? And that's another major problem before we go further, is something's wrong when everybody used to be friends. Mm -hmm. 
I used to teach you, you used to teach me, you borrowed my books, I gave you books, we talked about Masad with the Munakshah. Everybody used to be friends. Something's wrong. And every single person that has been refuted in Philly was once what? Friends. Friends. Every last one. No. Where do you start? Who, who, whose name you want to mention? Start with me, Tahir, Shadid, this one, Abu Muslimah, Hazrat Somali, Abu Hassan, and what? Everybody used to be friends. So how do people are friends, good friends for the deen and sunnah? There's not... Rajulani uh, Somebody's going to say that There are hadith about the people that are under Allah's shade Two men who meet each other for Allah's sake And meet for Allah's sake Because it's not for Allah's sake It's not for Allah's sake And the proof that it's not for Allah's sake Is that the same thing keeps happening over and over again You treacherous, you backstab somebody You want somebody as your friend Someone is your student, someone is your teacher Someone is ready to sit and eat with, talk with, study with And then you stab them in the back Mm. You turn on them, you lie on them, you slander them. Where do you want to start? Every last person that was refuted was also was all what? Mm. Everybody was together. Something is clearly what? Wrong. If you think critically. As far as if you just want to be pleased with not using your brain and just take it for it, then obviously, oh, oh, he's a demon. He was refuted. It's love for Allah and hate for Allah. It's not for Allah's sake. No. Mm. Alright, so let's get back to the to the lecture at hand. Alright. Um, it's well known. That I was very young, okay. I was always the youngest in the group, in the masjid, in the dawah center, in the jamia, in masjid salam. I was always the youngest, all right. And that's how my life was. I was one of older people. I was always the youngest. So when I went to, when I said I was going to go to Medina, some brothers tried to discourage me, and some brothers encouraged me to go. And I'm there. I went to go. And when I came back, uh, well, like it was a beautiful feeling coming back. It was a beautiful feeling. The brothers was smiling, shake, hug, mashallah, alhamdulillah, you stayed, this, this, and that. It was amazing. Everything was, was wonderful. They started making mash and khay, mm-hmm. all right? Everything was good. So as time went on, uh, Sheikh Fozi Athari came to America, all right? Uh, and he also brought Muhammad Kawadi, who was the Quran reciter. Mm-hmm. So I was in the Marquez, in the Dawah Center, and there many other brothers as well, okay? I can mention their names, but I won't, because alhamdulillah, I don't have no issues with those brothers. I don't have no issues with none of these people. People slander me, talk about me, that's one thing, but I'm not going around trying to fight nobody, trying to refute nobody. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying to you? Not saying that we can't. Everybody understand this, no. but that's just it's a waste of time. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the turning point is what? So we're in the hotel, and uh, one day is a class. Sheikh Muhammad Kawadi is at the Hilton. All right, it's a packed conference. So the main translator, I won't mention his name, he wasn't feeling well that morning. He said, I can't do it. He said, Mush, you got to translate. I was like, no, nah, man, you got it. So why do I say, no? I said, listen, we need you to translate today. I never translated a live lecture before. I translated books, tapes, transcribed, but I never translated a live lecture. Mm-hmm. I thought, all right, me that. So I went up there, uh, and I did the translation. The first time I was extremely nervous. I wasn't scared, but I was nervous. And alhamdulillah, by Allah's permission, everybody, you know, they was like, wow, it was amazing, especially for your first time. They're like, you're a natural. You're born to do this. You have a natural knack of translating. The shake and everything is like you did a great job. No. All right. When that happened, that's when everything started going sour. All right. Mm-hmm. Everything started going sour. I won't mention the brothers' mm-hmm. names. I can't mention the names. All of them, and they know this. They know this. I can mention all the names from A to Z, but I won't. Everything started getting real funny. There was personal meetings with the shake in the hotel. Everybody would be in the Dallas Center and say, "Oh no, you do this. You stay here." One brother, I love him if I mention his name. He actually he said, he says Mufti. He said Mufti, huh? Not Muhammad Ibn. He said Mufti. He said this. He said the Sheikh needs some cups for his room. Can't go down to the bar in the hotel and get some cups and bring it up to the Sheikh's room. You know me, I'm young. Gullible, I said sure, no problem. I went. I had to stand by the bar, get the cups. Went up the steps, knocked on the door. The brother came to the door with lamb. Sheikh, Sheikh. Walked back in the room, slammed the door in my face. It smell like curry chicken <laughs> coming out the door. What like? It's a true story. You can ask me. I'll mention his name if you want. Uh, okay. Man. So, so the point is, okay. But how crazy is that? We are all working together in the Dower Center, making tapes, answering questions. You and you having a personal powwow with the shake and say, go get. Him. It was after the, the translation though. After it was a shine. Before it was marhaba. Well, like the night before, I was in the room with the shake, and me. Okay, just, just, just be a little patient now. Because they're going to say, well, Sheikh Fozi is a deviant now. He's Bahraini. But back then, he was 
Sheikh Fozi Al Athari. Mm. All right. For the people who can remember, all right. And that's another agree. point that we got to get to later on with regards to erasing the history. That's what all criminals do. They erase their past. Mm. It's yeah. Well known. All criminals, they do what? They erase their past. They yeah. wash their money. They become clean, law abiding citizens. But all of your money was obtained illegally. But you have enough money to do what? Mm. Wash off the blood. Everybody understand this? And then no, you no. make, you give donations, you make different what? Charities. But you're a criminal. That's how you got your money. But that's, that's, that's what? No. That's another topic. It's a reality. Mm. So, that night, we was in the hotel room. Talking to Sheikh Fozi. Arabic. Sheikh was impressed. I'm like, mashallah, we talking on the side. I'll ask him questions. But when I did that translation, everything was different from that, from that, that point in time. No, no, no. So it was all right. It was cool. So the conference was over. We went back to the Dollar Center. And uh, I just thought it was a real funny vibe. Saying, brother, uh, Mufti can't do the khutbah. This is another major point. He asked me to do the khutbah. They asked me to do the classes. I never asked to do that stuff. They mm. pushed me up there. They wanted me to talk and to translate. He says, we're going to Brother Fulan's house for dinner. Everybody in the Dollar Center, you stay and hold down the fort. Which I didn't mind with a lad home. So anybody's going to ask, how you go from that to this? But anyhow, so what happened was, look, one day I was in the Dollar Center, and I noticed it was real funny. Mm -hmm. So all the brothers, they were going to go make Umrah. It was on 60th Street. It was on 60th Street. Mm -hmm. They were all going to make Umrah. So obviously, I wasn't invited to make Umrah, which is fine. I just came back from Medina. I mean, Umrah, a lot of how many times. It's cool. But this was, this was the first turning point. A brother, I won't mention his name, he knows who he is. He came up to me, it was just me and him, nobody was around. Brother used to teach me Arabic. He said, don't let the shaitan distract you from what you're doing. He says, don't let the shaitan push you back from what you're doing. I'm like, what are you talking about? He says, that's it. He says, don't listen to what they're saying about you, do what you're doing. This was in 2003. There was no Jat Hutta did, there was no Hezbi. This was, I was pure 101% Salafi. He mm -hmm. says, don't let the shaitan distract you from what you're doing. I said, cool. Later on, another brother came to me. I won't mention his name. He knows who he is. He said, yo, man. He said, Muf, that's not cool, man. He says, I'm not keeping the secret no more. He said, all the brothers is talking about you. He says, everybody you see in the Marquez that you help out, isn't that? He said, they're talking about you. He said, mm -hmm. I asked Sheikh Fozi al Afidi. I called him and other Mashaikh. And I said, yeah, Sheikh, we have an 18-year-old brother. Who's doing classes, who's doing khutbah, so on and so forth. Is this permissible? Some people are saying he's too young, he's getting in the way of the older brothers. He told me, the brother's name, I won't mention name, I will if I have to, I don't mind. He said, What? You can if you want. He said, he said What? Perhaps the brother may not want his name mentioned. He said, What? He said, The sheikh says, As long as he knows what he's talking about, then let him do what he's doing. He says, As long as he knows what he's talking about, then what? Let him do what he's doing. Keep that, that's one leap. Now, the next leap, one night we were in the Marquez. And some brothers from Camden, New Jersey came. All right? They know who they are as well. They came into Camden, New Jersey. And they basically, you remember this, I would say, they begged. They said, can one of you guys please come to Camden? This was way back. This was way before Camden was anything like it is today. All right? Mm -hmm. He says, can somebody come to Camden, New Jersey to do classes? They begged the brothers. No one wanted to do it. So another brother there, he said, what about? No. Mufti. Mufti then. Muhammad Ibn there now. He said, would you like to go? You know me, I said, sure. Alhamdulillah, why not? They said, when can you when can you come? I said, tomorrow. It was in Camden that next day. It was a snowstorm. We went to the masjid. The masjid was dead empty. Nobody was in the masjid. The Juma was like a joke. It was like you brothers sitting around. It was like people sitting here, him sitting there. It was tumbleweeds in the masjid, literally. So I did the khutbah. Everybody instantly fell in love. When can you come back? When can you do a class? So we developed a relationship with brothers in Camden. We go drink tea, go drink coffee, go get food. They would ask me, oh man, you know Arabic, I want to go overseas, I want to study so on and so forth. And time started going on and on. Every week I was going in and do a clip and do a class. So then people start calling me, asking me questions. People start getting advice about marriage and so on and so forth. So the brothers and the laws my witness, they called me and they said, Mufti, we need an imam at the masjid. They said, we need an imam at the masjid. I said, oh, I'm I'm not going to be the imam. They said, please. I said, no. They asked me again. I said, no. They said, listen, you come, you do the khutbahs. You do the classes. You sit with the brothers. You help everybody out. He says, you're doing everything that the imam is doing. Let us offer you something to help you out. You want to go back overseas. I was 19 at the time. I said, no. They begged me. I said, you know what? All right, I'll be the imam in the masjid. When I became the imam, that's when the whole dunya flipped upside down. 
Fulan said this, you disrespected Fulan. Astaghfirullah, he has no respect for his elders. Wallahi, mm. he's, he's arrogant, he thinks he knows everything. He shouldn't be the Imam, Yani, da 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 da. I'm like, what did I do? But would you like to name the people who turned on you? We'll get there, by Allah's permission. We'll get there. What's important is, <laughs> is that the whole entire dunya did what? Turned topsy turvy. I'm like, what? Madam Biana, what did I do? They begged me. And I was doing everything every week. No one went to come to the masjid. So it's cool, no problem. La best. So a brother one day, now you remember the conference, let's stop the discourse. I remember that for a long remember, time. Let's ago. stop the discord. Mm -hmm. The brother came to me one day, that's what he said, pulled me to the back of the camp, the masjid, and he said, they having a meeting about you right now. He said, the brothers that you see, this one, that one, they having a meeting about you, along with the brothers from Birmingham. Remember when they came, he said, yeah. they're coming to do a meeting about you. I said, about me? He said, yes. I said, what? He said, they're having a meeting about you. He says, be careful, watch your back. That's what he said. I can name every single name. I'll give you every isnad. Okay? If you want to do, uh, he's lying. All right, we can prove everything. He said, watch your back. He said, they ought to get you. There's no deviance. Ahlul Bidah, his be stuff. Okay? No problem. So as time went on, I stepped down from being the Amen. And it's going back to the original question about our brother Abu Hassan. Yeah. So I, I, I resigned on the member. When I gave the khutbah, Abu Hassan was sitting down in the crowd. He walked up to me, he said, you, or, or he didn't say it to me, he said it to other brothers, he said, Mufti shouldn't have done that. He shouldn't have resigned the way he did, and he shouldn't have announced to the people that I want to be the Imam. That's what he said. Well, how can I win? I be the Imam, people are attacking me. I stepped down from being the Imam, what? People attack. What am I supposed to do? So, no problem. So, a couple days later, or maybe like a week later, uh, I remember they brought in a U-Haul truck. Okay, and they brought in uh, Abu Hassan's library. Tons of books. All right, tons of books. Abu Hassan came up the steps. It was me and him in a room in the library. This was after Dawud Adib had left Camden. He came as well. I also had stepped down. Because Abu Hassan came to be the Imam. Then who died? Abu Awais. Abu Hassan left Camden. He went to Masjid Rahma. Then Dawud was the Imam in Camden. Then Dawud left. Then came back what? Abu Hassan. Or... or yeah, I need, truth. Let's let's go even deeper than that. Before Abu Wais had passed away. She mm, going back in the, in the show. Okay, tell you, this is old. What, what, thirteen years, fourteen years ago? Yeah. He came. He was the man before Dawda D. Mm -hmm. He walked up the steps. He gave me a hug and he apologized to me. That's Abu Hassan. Yes. He said it ain't like that. No, I, he said no. I got love for you. He said don't go anywhere. He said stay right here in this mass shit. Just because you ain't the man, don't stop doing what you're doing, benefiting the people. I was living next to the mansion, I had an apartment next to the mansion. He said, stay here and be with me. Cool, no problem. So we used to sit in the library. He would show me things from Yemen. He would show me things from Egypt. I got this Ijaz, I got this book. And we would just sit and we would talk. And then we would just sit in the library and talk all the time. No problems with mm -hmm. that, homie. Mm -hmm. So the, the term of factor is what? Is that when I found out that the people were talking about me and stuff, did it hurt? Of course it did. Was I young and gullible and naive, pure hearted? Of course I was. I couldn't imagine... The same brothers that I'm sitting, drinking tea with, starving in Medina, would ever talk about me like that behind my back. I could never, it was unfathomable, but it still was okay. But this was the concept of what? Is that something seriously wrong with some of these guys? No. They say one thing, but they what? Do something mm -hmm. totally different behind your back. They smile on your face, give you a hug, they call me Mufti in my face, but behind my back, oh, he shouldn't be teaching. He shouldn't be speaking, he shouldn't, he shouldn't. So there was the, the jealousy factor. So once I, once I realized that, I knew that it was a constant huh, growth nah. of maturity. Nah. But that wasn't the only problem, though. Because people, they're going to say, oh, you, so you left the brothers because of personal reasons. No, it's deeper than that. It's deeper than personal reasons. But the personal reason was the gate into your true character and your true akhlaq. And once you have a problem with integrity, I can't trust your religion. And it's one of the greatest lessons that we take from the sciences of hadith. Is that if a narrator is known for fisk, if a narrator is known for lying, if a narrator is not known for sticking to what he's supposed to stick to, his khabar is rejected, mm. no matter how strong his memory is. And the exact opposite, if a narrator is an innovator, if a narrator has other issues, but his ha, huh, his hiv is strong and his deen, his adala, is, uh, then his narration is what? Could be accepted, depending on the situation. But that's another discussion. Yeah. The science is on these. So the bottom line is, from that point on, I knew that I had to really pay attention and look who I was with and that I could not trust most of these people. 
Yeah. And I'm not talking about one brother specifically. I'm not talking about what? One, one person specifically. This is in general. All right? So as time went on, alhamdulillah, I went to Yemen. Mm -hmm. And I continued to learn. I continued to benefit. Then I came back from Yemen. Then I went to Medina. I continued to learn. I continued to benefit. And I'll say it openly and publicly. Uh, if I'm a deviant, if I'm a hisbi, maybe I am. I'll accept that. No one thing for sure, though, is that I'm a deviant. I'm a hisbi. I've left Salafia based off of what I believe to be the truth. That I honestly studied and learned and saw certain things and read certain things and heard certain things and went and studied things that made more sense to me what I had learned, heard, and seen other places. So me gradually moving away from these brothers, becoming friends with this one, mm -hmm. and saying this and doing this, it wasn't because I had personal problems with them, or I hated them, or I was just, no, 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 no. But it was, I believe, that I was miseducated, and I was mm -hmm. mistaught. Did everything they say to me and teach me, was it wrong? No, not everything. That's ungratefulness. But much of it was. Not all, but much of it was. Mm -hmm. So therefore, uh, we take another leap. I'm in the college of the Hadith now. Then you start talking about Anwar, you start talking about the brother, uh, uh, Abdul Wali, you start talking about all of them. Uh, and then you start talking about Tari and that whole thing, and that whole fitna. All right? And there's no doubt, Allah, alhamdulillah, opened up my eyes, opened up my ears to see and show a lot of truth. Yeah. So, the bottom line is that what? Is that um, there's been a very long saga. I've seen a lot, I've read a lot, I've been through a lot, personal stuff, religious stuff. And basically, I'm doing what I feel is right. If I'm wrong, may Allah forgive me. If I'm right, then that's between me and my Lord. Before you move on to the next question, because this is a very, very long discussion, as I said, no. my advice to every listener and watching is make sure what you're doing is right. Make sure that you got sincerity. Because a deviant who's sincere has a chance with Allah than someone who's Salafi and he's not sincere. His heart is full of jealousy and envy. He's a total blind follower. He's fanatical. Are you really sincere for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do you believe that that's the truth? Do you believe this person is an innovator? Do you believe that the wrath of Allah is upon this person? Do you believe that? Do you believe it's better to drink a cup of khamar than to listen to this guy? Do you really believe that? <laughs> can you stand in front of Allah with that? If you can, mashallah. And if you can't, if you can't look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself an honest question, you really need to reevaluate yourself. And I would say that's the case with most of the people today. They really don't know what they're saying and what they're talking about. And they really don't believe it. And the proof that they don't believe it is what? If you catch one of them by themselves, they'll speak to you and shake their hand. Mm. No. Yeah, but they want a group with the people, and then it's, oh, something's wrong. So that's in brief. Once again, this is in what? No, no. That's in brief with regards to how I changed, how I evolved. Would the brother say, Mufti used to be like this? No doubt about it. I did. And obviously, according to many of your standards, I probably am a deviant, according to your standards. Mm -hmm. Who is Salafi and who's not Salafi? What's the brother? He, we had an argument in Mecca in a Turkish restaurant. He said anyone who doesn't call himself Salafi is Angel Bidah. Mm. <laughs> Jamil Finch. Mm. Jamil Finch made this statement. Yeah, we had a, you can ask him. Subhan Years ago, we were on the Hajj. We were going back to Medina. He said anyone who does not say that they are Salafi is Angel Bidah. Bidah. Now, this was years ago. This was before I was really, you know, a total deviant myself. Mm. I said, what? My mouth dropped. I said, are you serious? He said, yeah. So we had a nice talk. So the conversation got heated in a friendly way, though. No. We left the Turkish restaurant. We got into the cabin. We went to Medina. He texted me on my phone. You know what he texted me? He said, yo, Muff, man, you smashed us tonight, man. You right. That's what he said. So the point I'm trying to get to is just one point. And not calling out names, which we can. That's not the point. That's not the point. The point I'm trying to get to is what? Is that many people, they'll say, no, you can't say that about Muhammad ibn Munir. Sometimes you can say that. Because there's certain principles... And things, that's an example of them. If that's what you believe that Salafi is, then I'm not Salafi. As Imam Shafi'i Rahim al Ta'ala said, if loving Ahlul Bayt is being a Shia, a Shi'i, then then call me what? If that's what if that's what Shi'ism is. If loving the Prophet Sallallahu family members. If that's what you call it, then what else? So so that's just one example of a sick perverted understanding. If you don't call yourself Salafi, you're automatically from the people of innovation. If that's your Dawah to Salafi, then I'm what? No doubt about that. And I say that, well, that hummed. Now, other things are clear lies, clear misconstrued facts. Some stuff I never even said, never even did. All types of stuff. But there are certain things in which I don't believe are correct. Ilmi and knowledge base. And if you want to talk about them and discuss them, then let's come and let's sit and let's talk. But with conditions. 
And the first condition is don't qu don't quote a modern day scholar. Mm. The second condition is if we have a munakasha, we make a condition that we start off based off of munakishin and not mukhalidin. Don't start mm. off the debate with proofs and evidences and principles, and then at the end of the debate, you just I, I follow the ulama, I submit to the ulama. No, we're gonna take off the gloves and that's the what? Don't tap out and say you hit me too hard. Mm -hmm. And obviously none of them are willing to do that. No. Mm -hmm. And there's reasons why, which we don't have to mention right now. Mm -hmm. So that's that's in brief. That's only what? Mm -hmm. That's only in brief. My next question much more than that. is how do we move how do we remove the shubha that you and uh brother Tarhawai Tar is calling to yourselves in the removal of scholars back at back in the east. Right. How do we remove that doubt? I don't try to remove that doubt. Anything that I say, or most of the stuff that I do is live stream. Check it out. What books do we teach? What books do we read? Those are not the books of the ulama? Sahihain, Bukhari Muslim, they're not the ulama? No. Sheikh Muhammad Ali Imam, one day in Yemen, he was asked about people who say that you don't call to Minhaj. Antum Nati Darusun Kutub al Minhaj. You don't teach the books of Minhaj. You know what he said? He said, Sahihain, Sunan Nabi Dawood, Tirmidhi, Musnad Ahmed, Muatta. He says, there's not Kutub al Minhaj? <laughs> he says Kutub al-Hadith That's not the, the way of the Salaf in there So that don't even make sense mm. That don't even what? Mm. Make sense Now if you if what you mean is We're not translating a lecture of a modern day scholar And every single talk And every question is a modern day scholar If that's what you mean Then I agree I agree I agree But if you mean that we're just making up stuff And everything that I say is based off my opinion My view What I think What I feel and I say this not being boastful. I don't think it's anybody that's explained as many books as we have on Hadith Disciple. Mm -hmm. And that stuff that's on the channel is only a small piece of the books and stuff that we teach. How many books have you finished? If I asked you, how many books have you finished? Mm -hmm. You make sharh and ta'liq. So what is what do you mean with we're, we're calling to ourselves? What are we supposed to call to? That doesn't even make sense. That's a lie. But if you mean a specific scholar or group of scholars, then perhaps. And this is another example of how, if that's what your Salafi is, then I guess I'm not Salafi. Mm -hmm. And I have reasons to say this. And I have proof and evidence to say this. Huh? Isn't the concept of following the Salafis to take the people back to the what? Something. The past. So how does that even make sense? Mm -hmm. That's just pure stupidity. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, Yanni. And, and last but not least, okay, no problem. Let's say if I say I want to teach Sayyid, are you going to do a book of this modern day scholar? Does that mean I'm deviant? Allah is angry with me because I, I want to teach a different style than you? What, the, what type of stuff is that? Yeah. What type of intelligence is that that you're using? And that's another issue with regards to when is allowed and not allowed to differ and to disagree. Mm. But that's a whole other discussion. Now, um, the next question would be, there's another uh, issue about to try to use, um, maybe you can some clarity to it. The issue of when we say our people, when we say our city, when we say that, you know, we're not going to take it anymore, we're going to say, well, our people deserve better. We want schools, we want social reform, we want wealth building, and you have brought us nothing but chaos. So we're saying that for a law, and then for the fact, for the jealousy of our land and our people, we think you guys need to be out of the way. So they try to say this is a nationalistic speech. So I would say this. The average person in Philadelphia studied in Saudi Arabia. Some mm -hmm. of us went to Egypt, some of us mm -hmm. went to Yemen, benefited, Mauritania, but the average person went to Saudi. Mm -hmm. I don't think, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think there's a radio program in Saudi. I don't think there's a school, a scholarship. I don't think there's any type of da'wah, any type of educational program that's done except that al mamlaka al Arabi Saudi is attached to it. Mm. Am I making this up? Mm. Every single program that they sponsor, you clearly see that it's done by what? The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Everything. What's the reason behind that? What's the wisdom? How does that apply to this? I'm trying to, show, I'm trying to show you something. Is that they themselves, they take pride in what? In what they're doing for their people, for their family. Is that the Quran and the Sunnah? I'm not saying that. I'm trying to make a proof. Is that the ulama that you claim to follow and cling to and clutch, what do they do? Mm -hmm. Everybody understand this? They deal with their problems there. Everybody understand this? What's going on? Their social ills, their ups and their downs, that comes what? First. And that's why Allah tells us in the Quran that if you've never sent a messenger, illa bi lisani qawmihi, except in the tongue of his people. What's the purpose of that? For his people to do what? Understand him. 
وَأَنْذِرْ عَشِيرَكَ عَشِيرَتَكَ Allah says and warn your ashira. Allah says what? Al-Aqrabin. The people who are closest to you. So if I say that my priority is for my people, I want to benefit my people. We have certain problems and ills. It doesn't mean that I'm a nationalist. It doesn't mean that it's only for my people and that no one else is welcome. But at the same time, if I'm in front of my people, I'm going to address the problems that what? My people have. And that is something that you learn when you live in Saudi Arabia for over 10 years. The first thing that they deal with is what? Mm -hmm. Their problems, their issues. Everybody understand this? No. Why all the classes in Arabic? Except because of what? That's what they, they say, speak. No. Everybody understand this? The zakat to the fitr is given in what? They give rice. Because that's a stable food of what? So the point is, and, 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 and shoot, you got to understand, son, the concept of people that are weak, scholastic, we don't have any proper knowledge, they have to call somebody a name. Mm. That's the first sign of somebody that doesn't have a lot of knowledge, is name calling, name tagging. Mm -hmm. And that's why Imam Shafi used to say, Man aliman illa He says, I never debated with a scholar except that I beat him. I won. He says, he says, and I never debated with an ignorant fool except that he won. Meaning, I've proven why he's wrong and why I'm right, but he says what? You're wrong. It gives you a name, a derogatory term. Mm -hmm. So instead of dealing with the situation at hand, whether it's fragmented homes, right. whether it's drug abuse, whether it's unemployment, whether it is self-hatred, whatever it is, you're a nationalist. Yeah. Okay, and this is one of the pillars of their corrupt dawah, is avoiding the situation at hand and abusing people with names and terms. If you don't believe me, then just transcribe their lectures. I guarantee you can have a dictionary of names and terms. Mutasattir, Mutalowin, Hizbi, Mudabdib, this, that. You don't love the ulama. That's the same thing that the grave worshippers said to Ibn Abdul Wahab. When he said the shirk is haram, he said you don't like the awliya. You hate the awliya. I don't hate the awliya, but shirk is wrong. It's not about black, 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 black and Philly, no. But I still have issues that I have to deal with my what? My people. So that's common sense. The moment you deny that, what good is your brain? Yes, sir. And there's other proofs and evidences, and that, that's a way of looking at it. You see what I'm saying to you? No. Wallahu No. In the uh, master's program, right? Uh, when you was doing your thesis, right? For your dissertation for your master's. What was, okay. Uh, what was the actual um, thesis present? Did you give benefits right. for that? The thesis, uh, when you do master's program, it's two ways of writing your thesis. You either do a modu or you do a taqiq. Or taqiq or dirasa. Mm -hmm. You either write your own book, your own topic, or you take a manuscript, a maqtuta, an original manuscript, maybe a hundred years old, or much more than that, obviously. You may take a manuscript maybe a thousand years old. Literally. Four hundred, seven hundred years old, all right? Depending on the scholar what century you lived in. If you write your own topic, let's say, for example, a compilation of hadiths on buying and selling. Or you write a topic, uh, the science of criticism in the 4th century. Mm -hmm. Or you take a makhtut, a book that Ibn Hajar wrote, a book that Ibn Abdul Bada wrote, a book that Imam Ahmed wrote, and the original manuscript, the hand, hand, handwritten, and then you turn it and you print it out and typeset it. And you give the annotation, the references. You do a study of Imam Ahmed's life, his mm -hmm. students. You do a study in the background on the book, the importance of the book, the status of the book. So what I did was, I did a tahqiq and I did a... I did a study of a manuscript, an annotation and an editing of a manuscript. Even though my original idea was to write a topic, but that's a long, long discussion. That's a long discussion. So the actual book is a, is a famous book in a Hanafi madhab called Al-Hidayah. It's not the biggest book or the most important book, but it is an important book. It's called Al-Hidayah. All right? Uh, al al uh, Came along a great scholar who was from the uh, Horn of Africa, Az-Zayla, rahimahullah. Okay? He did a study on this book in which he referenced all the ahadith and all the athar. When the author says the Prophet wiped over his head covering, the Prophet says, Salam, he told to Ibn Umar to take your wife back. Where can this hadith be found? Where did Ali ibn Abi Talib who decreed to fight the Mughat, the people that refused to obey him? He didn't call them Khawarij mm -hmm. either. That's another discussion. Nah, they weren't what? Khawaj wow. Bugat is different. Mm -hmm. Everybody understand this? And the only reason why I mention that is because of just the ignorance of the people today calling everybody Khadiji, which is foolishness. At the end of the day, where did Ali say this at? Where did Umar radiallahu say that the woman who loses her husband has to wait for a certain amount of time before she can remarry? The takhrij, the original source of this hadith or this athar. 
So Azayr, he came behind him and he wrote a book called Nasb al-Raya Fi Takhrij Ahadith al-Hidayah Then after Azayr, he came the great champion Al-Hafid bin Hajar Okay, who died 852 in Hijra We all know Bulugh al-Maram, Fattabari Alright, Nukhwat al-Fikr, Taqrib al-Tahdib Famous books And he made a summary of their book called Al-Diraya Fi Takhrij Ahadith al-Hidayah So the book was printed years ago in Lebanon, I believe so, Beirut the book wasn't printed that well, it wasn't a scholarly, scholastic print of the book. So, me and three other students, we took the book and we split it up. And we each took a section of the book, the original manuscript, typesetted it, referenced the different manuscripts, mm-hmm. made the annotations, study of the author, his book, so on and so forth, and that's our thesis. So I have from the book of Hajj, Kitab al-Hajj, to the book of Al-Bayin and Salim. So obviously you're talking about hundreds of hadiths, hundreds of athar, you're living in the books all day, all night. I'll just mention a brief story. When I was in the college of Hadith, uh, my neighbor was Hanif, Hanif Bashir. Uh, Hanif, yeah. yeah, Hanif. Did he tell you any Hanif. stories? How uh, we were neighbors? <laughs> yeah, he told us a little custom stories. Oh, yeah. man, his he day was, was starving, no food. He mentioned everybody. Uh, it's real. Yeah. So Hanif, he told me when they, we were in his library in his house, and he said there was a brother who's doing his master's thesis who got sick. I said, yeah, how did he get sick? He said he got ill from sitting in the chair for such a long time mm. that the sun was wrong with his back and his, his, his behind. I was mm. like, what? I said, that's impossible. What are you talking about? He said, I'm telling you it's true. So later on when I was doing my master's thesis, it was days you'd be sitting at the computer with your books in your library for so many hours. It's times I have bruises on my elbows from my elbows being in the chair, mm-hmm. typing so long, sitting, referencing so long, T, 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 eyes, blush, I read, studying, writing your book. Yeah. So the point I'm trying to get to is, is that um, uh, I benefited tremendously from the work. Uh, and as the librarian of the College of Hadith said, he said to me when I was leaving, and he bought a copy of my book for me to, to put it in the library. He said, you guys are lucky. He says, you did a book that is practical. You have a hadith of ahkam, the hadith of the halal and the haram, marriage, divorce, buying, selling, hajj, all these different things, funerals, amen, nubur. He says, other people, they do books that are just theoretical. He says, you actually have the meat and the potatoes of ilm mm-hmm. al-hadith. The halal and the haram on a daily basis. That's what he told me. And I think, this is a little off the topic, this is one of the problems that people had with me going into the master program. And why they were so jealous and so envious and just so nasty. is because they're afraid. They're afraid. And they know that when you go into certain programs, you want a certain level of knowledge. And then people are afraid of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Because when you start educating people, and once you yourself have the ability to read and decipher yourself, and not be a blind follower, it's now dangerous. That's why, obviously, you want to talk about being a nationalist and being a black nationalist or whatever they say. Why did they prevent slaves from learning how to read and write? Because they knew if they learn how to read and write, then they would what? They'll be empowered. And their authority will be clearly questioned. They didn't believe that black people was hanging from trees like apes and monkeys. They didn't believe that nonsense. Okay, they didn't believe that they were superior. If they were so superior, then why let black people learn how to read and write? Because they knew the power of what? And power of Italy. And even after slavery, which didn't end in 1865, many states people still were slaves. Okay, the worst education, the worst schools, the worst books, the least funding was given to the what? To the darker shade. For mm-hmm. what reason? Keep them ignorant and we stay in control of them. Yeah. And the only reason why I mention this for nobody to say, oh, he's a nationalist, it's just a historical fact, all right? It's nothing but a what? So, a historical yeah. fact. All right, or some people overseas in the Middle East with Arab culture don't teach women how to read and write. There are hadiths on this, which are all bogus, but they say don't teach women how to write. Why? Because my wife is ignorant and stupid, I can do what? Anything. And I can tell her anything. Allah says, kiss my feet. The Quran says to her, lick my toes. That's the wajib. No, this is this is reality. So if we can just listen, this how this whole thing plays out now. If we can just translate classes to the people. And I have somebody that uh, has the ability, to, and it's not about pride, or, but this is the haq. Someone who's actually studied and benefited from these books and can derive the rulings and make his own explanation, this and this and that. Based on the claim of the ulama. We can't have that. Because he's going to start exposing our lies. Let alone he's going to embarrass us. I can't even recite the Quran properly. I never studied nowhere. I never benefited. He got a master's degree. So mm-hmm. the master's degree means nothing. It doesn't mean anything. Sheikh Mufan ripped up his master's degree. This is what they say. Because they want to keep the people what dumb and stupid. Mm-hmm. And only the ulama. We tran- 
Everybody understand this? We can filter the information that you get. It's no different than the people on 45th and Walnut that don't allow their followers to read the Quran. Mm -hmm. And don't allow their followers to read any books of Hadith. You're not allowed to read nothing. We tell you what you can and cannot do. SubhanAllah. Now, and it, says, it sounds a little extreme, but if you think about it, it's what? It's control. It's the same concept. Only listen to this scholar. Only take from these brothers. Only take from this person. Only listen to this translation. A few years ago, before he was refuted, Ahmed Bezmoul, obviously he got refuted and just mysteriously disappeared. No one is talking about anything about him anymore. He, they translated that you can't take a translation of a Hizbi or unknown translator. So where's Sahih Bukhari go? Where's Sahih Muslim? Where's Qutb al go? Where's Ibn Kathir? Who translated those books? Yeah, they don't know. What was his motif? Everybody understand it's the dictionary. Webster's, ah, Webster's Merriam. So the point we're trying to get to is, is that when I got into the master's program, I met a whole nother level of hatred that I never knew existed. SubhanAllah. Mm -hmm. I never knew existed of um, Hasid. It was 10 times worse than before. And one of the reasons why they try to downplay it so much, so what, Tyre White has a PhD. PhD doesn't mean anything. The ulama, uh, what I said to Anwar, Anwar wrong, I mean, Anwar right. When I said to him, I said what? I said, I said, if the PhD don't mean nothing, why does Sheikh Rabi have one then? Mm -hmm. SubhanAllah. So that, that's, that's stupidity once more So the point that we're trying to get to is Is that it's reasons why they try to downplay Who they try to downplay To control the people And to keep people dumb and stupid I can control you because you don't know anything And the one who does know more than me and can teach you No, he's a deviant Leave mm -hmm. him alone, don't take from him Indeed, he doesn't call to the ulama it's, it's a game If you can't see that by now, 20 years Something's wrong with you mm. No, subhanAllah now, could we uh, just say, you know, the, uh, the last thing is, is um, some of the teachers that you have benefited the most from in your travels overseas. I, 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 I could mention the names, but they're unknown. And some of them might say they're deviants. <laughs> <laughs> All of it, uh, uh, what about some of them that's known? You some of their names, though? Mention some so of their names. The, the most influential teacher that I had in the College of Hadith is named Dr. Saud al Jarbui. Hafidullah. All right? He was one of the most notorious teachers in the College of Hadith. He was known to be harsh, to be mean. Brothers would take the exam, they would walk out the room making dua against them. I saw it. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> he would make you write an exam, mention the proof, mention the madhabs, Fulan, Uthkur, Uthkur, Ali, Bayin, Uktub, Akmin. You were you go in his exam, you would take a whole two hours to write his exam. I didn't take two hours, alhamdulillah, or hour. Well, alhamdulillah, I would normally finish quick. Mm -hmm. If I knew the stuff, I knew it. If I didn't know it, I didn't know it. So Saud al Jarbui. I was blessed by Allah for him to teach me four times. Mm -hmm. That's four semesters in, 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 uh, equating two years. Now, we know the Khajar Hadith had changed. Back before I went there, they used to teach Nail al-Otar as the main subject. It's Fukhan Hadith. But they switched it to Muharrab. So the Nidam changed a bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, you know, back in the day, Khajar Hadith, even to this day, but back then it had a severe reputation for being the most back-breaking college in the school. Mm -hmm. And even when I got there, perhaps we'll mention some of those stories later. At the end of the day, he was tough. Mm -hmm. He was known to have no mercy. He was known to have a lot of uh, place emphasis on memorizing and being strong. So most brothers, you only have a teacher only once, one semester out of eight, out of four years. That's it. Mm -hmm. I was blessed for him to teach me four years, four times in two years, different times. So I got a chance to really benefit from his style. I got a chance to be inspired and motivated by his this raw passion for hadith and for fiqh. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying to you? So he was the most influential teacher that I had. All right. No. There were many others as well in the school. Um, uh, Abdullah Musaid, Dr. Abdullah Musaid, he helped me out tremendously in fiqh sunnah and ilal, manhaj al mutaqaddimin, all types of stuff like this. As far as those who are well known outside of the uh, the University of Medina, then obviously alhamdulillah, I sat with all of the mashaykh in Medina. What did I have? All of them. When I was Salafi, when I became a deviant, when I left, when I was out, I sat with all of them. What did I have? I, there's no alam, alhamdulillah, I said with all of them, well, alhamdulillah, the whole yeah. list. But the main sheikh that I had when I was there was Sheikh Abdul Muslim Abad. Yeah. Sheikh Abdul Muslim Abad, in which he would teach Qutb al And I say this as an interesting fact, is that in 2002, 2003, when I first went to Medina, I was 18, before I got to school, I snuck and went and sit with Sheikh Abdul Muslim Abad. Because back then it wasn't cool to sit with him. He was, uh, we don't say he's a deviant, but... They would say he, he teaches Qutb al he doesn't know Jaqat Hadith. He doesn't know about the Dijah. Well, this specific group that's here is still without a doubt. Without a doubt. <laughs> we know who they are. They know who they are. 
But it's, this was taboo. You couldn't say this though. It was uncool to sit with Sheikh Abdul Muslim Abad in 2002. Uh huh. The only person that was like American that was sitting with him was probably Umay Sen. Mm -hmm. uh, he was sitting with him back then. All the other Western brothers, you couldn't, it was like you had to sneak and hide. So I went to his classes on Sunan Abi Dawood and 40 Hadith because I said what they saying ain't right. And this was back when? So don't say it's just a new thing. Mufti became a deviant because of money. He went to New York because of money. He started translating because ah, that's that's not true. That's, so the same that's people that's accurate. causing the chaos in Philadelphia is the same people that are saying that. Hey, hear me out, Sheikh. Listen. So I actually went to go like sneak, huh? To go sit with him. And obviously when I sat with him, I was amazed. Okay? So the point I'm trying to get, we can mention this for days. Story after story after story. And if I'm lying, then ask them. Tell them to say prove it or what? Or disprove it. Uh -huh. You believe what you want to believe. Just disprove it. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, Sheikh Abdul Muhsin uh, was extremely beneficial. All of them are Sheikh there. All mm -hmm. of them. Uh, Sheikh Ali Nasser Faqih, Sheikh Obey, all of them Sheikh I benefited from. But if I had to pick one that stood out the most, it was Sheikh Abdul Muhsin. And that's mm -hmm. because his specialty was Hadith. And how he knew the Rijal, and how he knew the Fiqh of the Hadith. Mm -hmm. And it was hundreds of people sitting in his class. And most importantly, he was dedicated. He taught six days a week, more than anybody. He was an old man, he could barely see, pretty much blind. And you go to his mash and ask him anything, talk with him, walk with him, hold his hand. So that's what I, I benefited from the most. Now obviously I benefited from the tapes. It was no CDs or you know MP3s like that. We had tapes. Mm -hmm. Abani, Ben Baz, Uthameen, Sheikh Mukwa, and Shaykh. Yeah. But Shaykh the Muslim from those who are alive was the one who influenced me the most. Mm -hmm. Allah Adam. Yeah, sure. What was your greatest trial? My Let's greatest trial? That's a hard question. Uh, I would say is keeping your composure when you look at yourself in the mirror. You look at yourself in the mirror and saying you learn all of this stuff, you memorize all of this stuff, but what are you implementing? Maybe you be from the Munafiqeen. You know all this, but what are you doing? What is it? This is real. Because it's like a roller coaster. I had no idea, I had no clue that it was going to be how it was when I first started learning Aleph Batef. I had no idea I was going to go to Mecca, Medina, I was going to do this. I had no idea I'll be doing the things I'm doing. I had no idea I'll be translating for the Grand Mufti of, of Medina in the newspaper. I had no idea. So it's like you get on a thing and you don't know it's going to go that fast. Whoa, you thought, I want to get off, but you can't. The thing is locked. Mm -hmm. So the item is like, you think that it's a simple thing, and then you start learning and say, whoa, now my actions now. Mm -hmm. Where are they? No. You see what I'm saying? So you, and there are other trials. You know, there are other trials, but I mean... I, the second most difficult trial I'll probably say is betrayal when you don't expect it. Mm, yeah, yeah. 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 And I remember there's a brother, okay, um, he was from Camden. Oh, they all they know him. We were in his house one day. This was my first year to college. My first year to college. He said to me, it was me and him in the room alone, he said, Mufti, he said, You're gonna learn so many hadiths. He says they all wanna start hating on you. He said they're gonna start talking. About. I said, No, nah, what are you talking about, man? He said, mark my word. He said, mark my word. That was in 2004, maybe. 2005. Well, to this day now, you become a deviant. No doubt. You know, can you, last but not least, can you at least shed some light on why um, why you go and, you know, go to different places, why you don't feel restricted to give dawah anywhere? Clear. Why don't you feel restricted to give dawah in any place? I would say is... Uh, there's a lot of lies being spread, a lot of lies. Some brothers who don't lie, they tell things that are truthful, but they misconstrue them. And some people who the average person, nine out of ten, is just blindly following the next man. They just tape recorders. Yeah. The same sound chips, the sound bites, over repeated over and over and over mm -hmm. again. So you hear the Salaf never went to Ahlul Bidah to teach. Yeah. And you hear the Salaf never took anything from Ahlul Bidah. And you hear... Uh, we don't increase their numbers. And you hear, and you hear, and you hear, and you hear, and you hear. Tell you, no problem. You hear these things in 2001, 2002, 2003. But then you start reading and studying and actually digging. They said, Butun and Qutb, Al Ghawsfi, Butun and Qutb. You start mm -hmm. cracking open the books and you start reading certain things and hearing certain things like, whoa, 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 whoa. Something is not what? Right. Something ain't right. <laughs> Something isn't right. What they're saying is totally inconsistent with what I'm reading. Everybody understand this? No, no. So, the concept of, let's deal with the concept of taking from Ahlul Bidah or teaching Ahlul Bidah. The first thing that has to be established is who is Ahlul Bidah? 
What does that mean? Who's the Mubtadi? Exactly. Okay? Obviously, we heard from the brother. I don't, I don't even like saying that because that's how they talk. The brother. We heard from Jamil Finch. He said anyone who doesn't call himself Salafi is Ahlul Bidah. Mm -hmm. The question is, where did he get that from? You think he made it up himself? Mm -hmm. He was spoon-fed that information. So, according to that definition, the whole entire city is what? <laughs> Except for how many masjids? Three, three or four. Okay, so, that's, that's, our, that, that, that's, that's something for you to think about critically. When someone's from Ahlul Bidah, what does that mean? Allah is pleased with them or angry with them? Same Same thing. When they die... They have a big chance of going where? The hell for no. All Allah only wanted good for what? A select mm -hmm. few people. SubhanAllah. Everybody understand this? So, now, pay attention now. Going to teach in the masjid of Ahlul Bidah. What necessitates someone to be what? Ahlul Bidah. An ignorant Muslim? A Muslim that came from the nation of Islam? A Muslim that never learned to never study? A Muslim that comes from a third world country that's a cab driver? Huh? That loves Allah and His Messenger and follows and listens to anyone who talks and teaches them. They're innovators. They're Ahlul Bidah. Whoever goes to them and teaches them, that's what? That's what they take from. So if they were never taught properly, if they never received the proper information, how can you say that they're Ahlul Bidah? Or they're Mubtadid? Or let's even get deeper than that. Let's even get deeper than that. Let, let, let's, let's be real now. Let's talk about Philadelphia. Okay? I'm not from some island. I'm from Philadelphia. Let's get real. There's an older brother who's an American. He used to be a Christian. He was a pimp. He was in the Vietnam War. He went through the heroin days. He heard about Nation of Islam, Fruit of Islam. And he thought that was the truth after Christianity. Then after that, he learned about the Dar movement, the Dar Salam movement. And, then, and that's what he feels and believes to be what? The truth. So he's been Muslim for years. He literally fought. He literally stood up in the, front, in the face of racism, civil rights movement. Establishing a masjid, not eating pork, his Christian grandmother, to establish a masjid in a community. Getting rid of drug dealers and pushing them off the block for it to be a safe, clean zone and environment for Muslim sisters to walk by. He doesn't know much. He was never formally trained and educated. He didn't go to Saudi Arabia. He doesn't know. He, doesn't, he memorized a few surahs out the prayer and he can barely speak. But it's the best that he could do. You go. What's your name, Akhi? Abdurrahman. You go to Medina. You're young, young whippersnapper, young sharp. You learn, you study. You learn in one year what he didn't learn in 20 years, 30 years. You come back to his masjid, he's a deviant, he's ignorant, he's stupid, he's ahlul bidah, everything you do is wrong, I'm going to take over the masjid, give me your daughter, give, I'm going to take over everything. What do you think he's going to say? Subhanallah. He's, the first thing he's going to say is, we was fighting drug dealers and stuff when you was what? Before you was born. Now, that I, I'm, I'm trying to prove a point here. Is that this person, he didn't reject the sunnah because he doesn't like the sunnah. There's no Muslim that doesn't like the sunnah. There's no Muslim that's going to deny the fact that the best Muslims were the what? The earliest Muslims. Mm -hmm. But you come, no respect, no wisdom, coming from a country, Saudi Arabia, that he thinks and believes conspires against black people in America, and the list goes on. What is, his, what is he going to do? He's yeah. going to say, get the heck out of here. None. So once he runs you out of that masjid, you can't come back and teach that masjid. You go back and say, they don't want the dawah, they don't want salafiyah, they don't want the sunnah, they're now labeled what? Mubtadiyah. Ahlul Bidah. No, subhanAllah. And if you don't think this is a reality, then just look at what happened in this city. I'm not making this up. This is, this is what happened in most masjids. No, I'm just happy. Yeah. So the concept is of just labeling someone an innovator, Ahlul Bidah, is extremely dangerous. As Shaykh Rasulullah ibn Taymiyyah said, that tabdiyah and tafsiq and tadlib. This I mean, Babel Asma'i Well, I can Let's give somebody a ruling Call someone a mu'min Or a kafir A fasid A asi A ta'ya Or a muti'a These are rulings that can't be thrown around And he also explained to us that He says In the takfir ukhta takfir In the ukhta takfir Once you say somebody's a mu'tadi'a They're on the border of being what? Kafir I don't speak to you I don't go to your funeral You can't marry my daughter I don't marry your daughter We don't buy, we don't sell You have no hukuk as a Muslim That's almost what? Yeah. No doubt about that. That's a long discussion as well. The point we're trying to get to is labeling a master to be a master of Ahlul Bidah is something that me, I could be wrong in this, I do not agree with that precept. I do not agree with that concept. That this master of these ignorant, layman Muslims are innovators in their deviance. They're ignorant Muslims. They've never been taught properly. Were the people that were stubborn? Yes. Were the people that were arrogant? They had full cups? No doubt. Were the people that should have listened to the brother that went to Mecca and Medina? No doubt. 
But the fact of the matter is, everything was not presented properly. For them to have the ability to accept it or to do what? Reject, Reject it. it. Then you say, they are Ahl al -bidah. They don't want the Sunnah, they don't want knowledge. Mm. So I feel that that introduction is totally bogus. Calling and labeling someone a Mubtadi or Ahl al -bidah or Deviant. My personal opinion. I could be wrong. Secondly is what? Even if they are Ahl al or if they're head, if he's a Mubtadi, what about his followers? And let's stop right now. If they were so evil, and if they were so deviant, then why are they inviting me to speak at their masjid? You don't think they see how high my thobe, my thobe is, Ali? You don't, think they, you don't think they know where I study? You don't think they know that I used to be a part of the community and I left and I went and I'm a Salafi? You don't think they know that? So if they didn't want no good and they were totally evil and nasty, why are they saying come and what? Teach. Teach. That does not make what? Sense. 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 Now, someone who's obstinate, someone who wants to be this and that, that's a what? That's a different story. That's a different what? That's a different story. But we're talking about the average nine to five layman Muslim. He's taught that Allah is in every place, and that's what he believes. He was taught that Allah is above the throne, that's what he what? <laughs> because he's ignorant, follower, and he never studied. So I don't, we don't agree with that, that concept from the jump, from the get-go. And even if it was, it does not prevent me from going and teaching people that need to be taught. And don't put no conditions and stipulations on me. Now, I'm, I'm going to end this with one thing, because this is going to be a long lecture. It's a tape that I had back in the day of Sheikh Rabir. A tape. A lecture. I'm not going to mention it. I can't, but I'm not going to mention it. I want to leave it vague. So they can say he's lying. And then we what? Uh, no doubt. Uh, like an anvil on an egg. Alright? The tape of Sheikh Rabir and what he talks about when he went to Sudan. He went to Sudan. For dollar purposes. Everybody who's been to Sudan, he knows about Sudan. Sudan is full of what? Sudan. Well known. So he said that he went to Sudan and his guide, or his host, that was clearly Salafi, you know, in the Sunnah, whatever, he told him, yeah, Sheikh, we're going to take you to a masjid in which there are people who have problems with qubur, graves, and istighatha, and istiana, and a halif, swearing by the Prophet, seeking help in the Prophet. They believe it to be permissible. Mm. So Sheikh, if you can please go and give a khutbah, but don't call no names. Don't speak about them, don't disrespect them, don't bring up any of these controversial things. Sheikh said, no problem. He said, I gave the khutbah there, and I did the khutbah, he says, all from the Qur'an. On the ayat about calling on other than Allah, invoking other than Allah, seeking out for other than Allah. And that's the only thing I spoke about. So after the khutbah, he said, they loved me. They gave me hugs, they gave me kisses, and they welcomed me. So that's, that's just one among many other things. The point we're trying to get to is what? Is the concept of a poor, ignorant... Lame in person Forget the imam of the mansion He's a deviant No problem But his people are starving and dying I have an opportunity of teaching them And calling them And giving them some guidance What is my responsibility as a caller to Allah? Mm. If they want the haq they'll come to me They're mm. deviant they're... No one is going to talk like that logically Now if you want to get into the technical issue Of is it permissible to go Is it permissible to take Then that's a whole extensive lecture in which we can read the kalam of the ulama of the past. And that was one of the problems that I had with the whole Jarhul Tadil thing. You're not applying the science. You haven't read enough books on Jarhul Tadil to talk about what it is and what it isn't. Mm. Because you're going to find narrators that were clearly what? Ahlul Bidah. They learned from, they taught, they studied, and they traveled. That's a long discussion. And that's another reason why they had so much hatred for the master's program. Because they know you can access to certain books that are secret. Mm -hmm. And they don't want the people to know about these things because it's going to destroy their whole entire complex. It's going to blow it to smithereens. Lying to the people and hiding things from the people. Does it mean we're trying to call the bid'ah? No. Does it mean we want to be happy, go lucky? No, it doesn't mean that. It's about teaching people that are ignorant, that don't know any better. It's about educating them and calling them. And they deserve an opportunity to learn what is true. Mm -hmm. No. What a love people. Jazakallah yeah, yeah, We like to <laughs> I would like to ask the brother more questions but you know alhamdulillah. So another time we come we can yeah. do some things. Okay? It's not a problem inshallah, 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 inshallah. 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 My advice, my last piece of advice what? is don't take anything from me. Don't take it from me. <laughs> read. Read yourself. No. Study. You'll no. see it. No. That's my advice. Don't connect yourself to me. No. Don't attach yourself to me. Don't defend me. I talk about it all the time. Oh, I got into a fight. Don't get in a fight over me. Don't defend me. No. It's unnecessary. No, exactly. So now you all heard it from the. <laughs>
actually, as they say, the horse's, the horse's mouth, mouth, horse's mouth. That our beloved brother did not put us up to what we're doing, inshallah ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, may Allah continue to reward him and bless him. Inshallah ta'ala, Allah wants to benefit from the knowledge and the fuddle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him. And inshallah ta'ala, maybe he come back and visit us and do some book reviews here in the library. Uh, and some, you know, some different talks and stuff. And we like to cooperate nah, with the nah, brother, inshallah. that's not true. I, I, every time I talk to you on the phone, I, we, we talk about other stuff. When are you going to come to New York? How's the neck tip? Ain't nobody put no battery packet, no energizer bunny in nobody's back. No. And I said this before with the, the other stuff. No. I knew people was talking about me for years. No. For years. And I ignored them for years for specific reasons. No. For specific reasons. I didn't tell them to start talking about people and refuting people. I didn't. I no. That's not true. No. We didn't have enough time to get into the concept of lying. And how many people are liars and how many people lie. Uh, no. That's a whole, but no. for the record, I never, we never ever came together for an ever done. No. no, that's not true no. at all. Radical. That's a lie. It's Kevin. Radical low feet. Uh, we ask again, we ask the loss of one of the island to bless our brother, inshallah, to make his travels back. One question says, Where is your proof that they are liars? <laughs> you want to answer that, Jay? Put the agreement up there. Jay, tell the answer that. Put the agreement up there. The proof that. But well, what first? I mean, Abu Isa said that we are trying to do what? Push people to do these interviews and you know whatever you want to call them, reputation, whatever. The proof that it's a lie, and I'm telling you right here that I never ever spoke to you about any of this. No, you didn't. No, and anyone not. who says that is making up a what? We did our own. We got our own shit hat on it. How about what? That ain't make sense. Nah, mashallah, mashallah, barakallahu fiik, Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Jazakallah khair.